Well, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank a few people, but first I want to comment on uh, what great readings um, so far. Uh, they're all too short, um, so I'll make up for it by going twice as long. <laughs> Um, I do want to point out, uh, it was nice of Vincent to, uh, to thank me right off the top, but um, uh, as you can see, he's, uh, he's fully formed. Um, mentoring is uh, sometimes just like, you know, small suggesting, you know, like, do your thing, you know. <laughs> um, I, think, I think you know what you're doing. Um, so in that, in that sense, not that I wasn't earning my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <they're laughs> sometimes you just have to, you know, because I don't know that we had that many exchanges, actually. You were probably pretty pretty on board with what you were doing, um, and keep right on. Um, I thought I would start, um, I had the pleasure of reading um, at an event two years ago here in Ottawa. Um, Shane read uh, there as well, and um, I uh, haven't always read found poems. I just I'm not good at finding them, I guess. Um, so, uh, but I did find one, um, uh, and uh, I thought, it, as a as a nod to, to Shane's uh, very strong work there, that I would uh, uh, I would read that. It's from a book called The Annotated Bee and Me. Um, thanks to all the people involved at Verse Fest and and with Arc Magazine, um, it's 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 a huge privilege um, to to travel as a poet and and read uh, for people. So um, I'll try to keep the mood. I'll try. How many? How many? Okay, okay, be honest. How many? How many poets are out here? Hands, come on. There we go. Quite a few. Good, because this will make sense. Maybe only to poets. Um, it's, uh, I wrote this book, it's, it's entirely, it's sort of about my family's beekeeping history in Edmonton around the turn of the century, like way back in 1905. They came from Ontario to Edmonton and they were commercial beekeepers. Um, so I read a lot of books about beekeeping and uh, this is my found poem. This is from a, a book and you, I, all I did was I, well, I'll read it. Poem found in an abandoned hive. In Beekeeping the Gentle Craft by John F. Adams, with poet substituted for drone and a few other minor word changes. <laughs> the life of the poet is relatively long unless he fulfills his destiny by mating. <laughs> In spite of his being a drag on the domestic economy of the nation, he has suffered gladly, tolerated, and even pampered by all. Poets seem to be accepted in any country regardless of where they actually reside and may request and get a handout in any country where their sisters and mothers would be regarded as foreigners or bandits and assassinated on the spot. <laughs> this universal hospitality which is extended to poets likely results from their range. While this matter is not known exactly, it seems that the haunts of the poet may extend be much beyond the range of the ordinary person. Some think it may be six or eight miles. During a time of want, however, a scarcity of money during the summer or at the onset of autumn, the tolerance for poets ends. <laughs> With utter lack of sentiment, Poets are summarily excluded from society and denied food by their sister mothers. Since the poets are incapable of feeding themselves, they quickly die. It is absolutely characteristic of autumn in the city to see crowds of rejected poets in front of each cafe, sternly being denied entrance. And as the autumn deepens, in front of the cafes and generally around the city will be seen the dead husks of poets, finally having succumbed to starvation and the weather. <laughs> Thank you. I don't actually write too many comic poems, so it's kind of hard to come down <laughs> from there. But So I'm going to read... The one poem that my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, every time I go to an event, she says, did you read that? Did you read the Volvo poem? 
And I, I'm going to go home from Ottawa all the way back to Edmonton, and she'll ask me, and I want to tell her that I did, because it's her favorite. Um, I have to set it up a tiny bit. It is, uh, I was a salmon fisherman uh, up until I was about 30 years old, and my family were salmon people, salmon people. Um, <laughs> And as the industry started to decline and as things got worse and worse for us, we no longer owned boats, we started to rent boats. And then the boats we were renting got worse and worse. And, and Anyway, I have two older brothers and uh, they're both 16 or 17 years older than me, two of them. And I was fishing with my eldest brother and there was, um, uh, he was going through a divorce at one point. Um, so I was kind of as listening. You know, when you're on the river, um, you know, there's a lot of time when you're sitting around. So this is kind of a um, sort of a song, I guess, for uh, for those days on the riv river. And Gaspero actually put this poem out in a beautiful, lovely accordion book format, which I was really delighted about because it's kind of um, uh, kind of a funny poem. Refrain for rental boat number four. Something was wrong with the Volvo prop. Net in the wheel, mud off the bar, smoke on the moon. Something was wrong with the Volvo prop. The leg wouldn't drop. We had to get a tow from Crazy Carlos, the Portuguese. He hucked a rope. Veering wildly, bank to bank, toward the cemetery deadheads, we waited for that hemp to snap. It held. Something was wrong with the Volvo prop. We drifted off Carlos, stern to the waves, found Massey, he put us up. At the phone booth, we called Ken Shock, hoped he wasn't three sheets to the fucking because something was wrong with the Volvo prop. We were bleeding cash and missing blood. The river just opened at the height of the run. We were cursing whatever gods we had got. Shit, something was wrong with the Volvo prop. The salmon were dying, some are almost done. And something, something, the price of oil, the valve of age, the knot in the trunk of the throat, something was, well, it wasn't right, it was buggered, jiggered, haywire, out of whack, we were missing the full moon on the high water slack, how can I tell you, the perfect tide for the prairie, perfect tide for the past, Jesus H. Christ, we were stuck at the dock, something was wrong with the Volvo prop, the leg wouldn't drop, won't drop, is wrong, I can't explain. The moon, the years, I can't be any clearer. The high water slack, the face of my brother. I still wake up two decades later, the middle of the night, dark all around, river sound, eyes haunting the haunted clock. Something is wrong with the Volvo prop. She has no idea what a Volvo prop is, and so you <laughs> probably don't either, but... Um, there are no actual children in the room, I believe. No actual children, technically children. I mean, you might be psychologically children. Um, actually, you are, as far as I'm concerned, we're always uh, children. I write a fair bit about childhood. I can't, frankly, and I'll read a poem after this one that deals with this, I can't frankly believe that uh, I am 50 years old, but I am. Childhood. I want it back. It is unseemly to admit so. The many who confuse a love for the present of the past with a love for something dead roll their eyes. Forget them. This is for men and women of certain years who, having left prints on the sand, remember the feeling of castles in their fingers and turn for the fanfare blowing silent out of the mouth of the sun. For those who, when the utilities are paid another month and the children in their intensities occupied and the laundry transferred once more to the light, sit on the grass in the yard and place one hand on the sun-warmed gold of the sleeping retriever's fur to take the pulse of that small self they say goodbye to a little more each day. For those voters, taxpayers, bearers of the ordinary burden without end or praise, who for a few seconds bury their faces in the old trinity, earth, sun, beast, and breathe that lost present alive, tending the last coals of a fire in the woodcutter's woods before the blank page of the story turns back again with the sound of a whale sliding its Victorian nursery for the last time into the sea. 
I have three kids, um, two boys and a girl. They're 11, 13, and 15. And I wrote this before my youngest was this particular age. For my sons, I wake every day in disbelief that I am not 10 years old. I go to sleep every night in disbelief that I am not 10 years old. When I laugh, I laugh just as if I were 10 years old. When I cry, I cry just as if I were 10 years old. My anger feels the same as the anger I knew at 10 years old. My hatred of clocks is the same as when I was 10 years old. 10 years old is letting the dog of the self off the leash. 10 years old is walking the little brother of the self off to school. 10 years old is hating church but loving stained glass. 10 years old is stealing your reflection from the river. 10 years old is the currency I'm minting in my basement. My ship is set to the compass of 10 years old. My rainstorms are falling in the barometer of 10 years old. Only that many autumns and no more. Only that many winters and springs, that many summers. Who is this child who eats my bread, who owns me body and soul, who will walk me into the earth at ten years old?